Your inner child needs your time, direction, and attention in order to flourish into the wonder that you are. In this episode, I'll discuss ways you can supply your unmet childhood needs by choosing a new, non-shaming family of choice and finding a loving higher power. We'll look at various techniques to correct deficits from the past, allowing you to move from victim to victor. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. We're going to continue uh, something we started the last time, which was to talk about championing, championing the child. Now, that's a, that's a word my own inner child likes, and I was attracted to that word, the idea of having a champion in your life. Uh, I wish that I'd had a champion as a child. One of the great deep losses in my life was not having a father. And the, the idea of uh, not growing up with, with any sense of protection. And so that, that's one of the ways that I understand becoming a champion to my own child, giving myself protection. And last uh, time, one of the programs, we talked about uh, the four P's of therapeutic change. I took three of these from Eric Byrne, who was the founder of Transactional Analysis. And he talked about a new source of potency. In order to change, you need a new, new source of potency. Literally, the child in you needs a new source of potency. And you need to get new permissions. So in another program, we talked about uh, changing rules, uh, breaking the no-talk rule, breaking the no-feel rule, breaking rules about you can trust your eyes and ears. Uh, you can make a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes. We really have to let our little inner child know that. Uh, also, the inner child needs protection. Because when you first start this work, it's like there's a part of your head that when you get all this family system stuff and you really begin to understand it, it's kind of shocking at first. You know, it's like uh, I've had people write me out of the family series and they say, you ruined my childhood. Uh, <laughs> I had this great childhood until you came along. Uh, and, uh, you yeah, know, I'm sorry about that. I'm not trying to ruin anybody's childhood. We're trying to heal the child so that we can have this child in our life. And uh, we spent several programs looking at all that painful feeling work uh, that, that you have to go through, I think, to finish the past. You can't finish something unless you grieve it. Now that we've grieved it and we've reclaimed the child, now we begin to re-champion the child or champion the child or reparent the child and to begin to give this child the kind of nurturing uh, that the child never got. Now, in the process, we need protection because there's a part of my kid that goes, wait a minute, you know, I don't know whether I trust these new, these new people or these people that are writing or these things I'm reading. Uh, no, when I read Alice Miller, I really get it. And then I go away and little voices come on. And say, now, wait a minute. You didn't have that bad a childhood. You had three squares and a roof over your head. Let's don't get carried away here. And uh, some of you know very well, like when you're working on sexual addiction or you're working on physical, I mean, sexual abuse or physical abuse, how at, at first when you start getting to memories, it seems like, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe I'm just making this up. See, I see some of your heads nodding. And then, and then gradually you begin to get it that, whoa, wait a minute. And all these pieces start coming together as you find out the truth of your childhood. So in the process, we need protection because it's very scary to the child to leave home. Some of you may remember the program we did where we did the homecoming meditation. And I said, you're standing there with your child and you see your parents come out on the porch. Tell them goodbye and start walking. 
But when we do this in the workshops, oh man, people just start wailing because it's very scary to leave those parents. And in a sense, my hope is you leave in order to go back. That is, you leave in order to have a relationship with them. I have the best relationship with my mother that I've ever had. I held my father on his deathbed. Uh, even though we didn't have much of a relationship, we had as much as we could have at the end. Uh, so, so the goal here is not to say I'm never going to have anything to do with my family again. It is to leave so that I can become the person I was meant to be, that I can build my own boundaries, have my own life, and then I can choose what kind of relationship I want to have with that family. And hopefully you will want to have a relationship. You love them. You do want to have a relationship with them. Uh, the fourth P in championing is one I've added, not that Eric Byrne wouldn't know this, is practice. Doing practice. So we're going to talk uh, in this program about infancy. What can you do if you didn't get your infancy needs met? What can you do if you didn't get your toddler needs met? What can you do if you didn't get your preschool needs met? We're going to look at all those areas. The, the first thing that's most important is uh, for the child to believe in you. And, and so the way that I like to draw this is that now that you're championing the child, it's like the child's out here in your consciousness. You know, I'm the champion. Now, I, I, I like to appear as a wizard to my child because I collect wizards. So I usually have some little stars on my toes or, you know, you know maybe a wizard hat, <laughs> in, 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 something like that, and a wand with a star on it because uh, little John likes wizards. I have this collection of wizards. And uh, you see, to, to a child, to you as a five-year-old, if you walked into the scene... Uh, you, you would be a very compassionate, powerful stranger. You would be magical. Ron Kurtz talks about, about the, the, uh, the adult coming into the child in, in his therapeutic process as magical. So it's very important to know that you're, you're powerful to that child and that you can protect that child. And one of the things that I recommend to everyone is finding a support group finding a group of people, finding a new family of affiliation. For me, that was my 12-step group for a while. Uh, now it is a support group that I have created of, of, of some men. I especially needed a male support group. I don't mean that in any sexist or prejudiced way. It's just I never had a father, and I never was loved by a man. So I didn't know what the love of a man... I had a grandfather. I knew what the love of a grandfather was. But, but there's a difference. That father wound has been a very big wound in my life. So f forming a support group has been enormously important. It's like a new family. Sharon Wexheider Cruz calls it a new family of choice. It doesn't mean you leave your, your other family. But this family needs to be a non-shaming place. A place where you, can, you know you can go and you're not going to get shamed. Where you can have your feelings. Like any of you have been following some of the programs we've done, you see them sitting in the group sharing, validating. Enormously important that we have that. Then we can, we can as adults, I can use my adult to find new fathers and new mothers. Now I really want you to hear how I said that. I don't want to let my child find a new father or mother. I want to let my adult find a new father or mother. So in my support group, uh, I was real sad on my birthday two years ago. Uh, Johnny, who's in my support group, brought me a custom-made putter. I take that as an act of fathering. Uh, a year later, his mother died. I was there for him uh, in a nurturing, caring, supporting way. He can use me as a father. I can use him as a father. Uh, I have uh, women in my life that, that are mothering and that I can be fathering to. And we've made those contracts with each other. These are non-sexual, -se sensual. These are friendships that, that are commitments 
Mary Bell at our Center for Recovering Families has been very loving to me, and I, I can be fathering to her, and she can be mothering to me. Now, I talked in another program about intellectual mothers and fathers. Uh, Virginia Satir, Marion Woodman, Robert Bly, uh, Jacques Maritain. The, these have been some of my intellectual mothers and fathers. And uh, I can think of, uh, you know, people that have been in my life, in my childhood, like uh, Sister Mary Uberta and I still write letters to each other from time to time. And uh, there's a priest in Toronto named Father David that is a very important person in my life. He loved me at my worst. He loved me at my worst. And I have some people in the 12-step group that I went into who saw, you know, when I, well, here I am an alcoholic, and I tell them all my worst, and they loved me. They were there for me. So, so I consider those people part of my family of affiliation, and, and, and I use them as mothers and fathers. Uh, there have been many people in my life that have been mothering and fathering. The danger is, is to have the kid do it, because he wants to make them into mother all the time. You have to be my mother all the time. Like, like, I'm getting very special care during, during this series. And, uh, um, you know, my hair is being done and my clothes are being put on for me. I'm kind of I'm liking this. Uh, <laughs> and, and my inner child is going, hey, let's do a few more days of this. Uh, this is very nice. Uh, but, but it's a reciprocity. See, a child has a right to, to, to unconditional love, especially in the first years where a child is helpless. I don't think as adults that that's really possible. I think it needs to be reciprocal. That is, it needs to be, yeah, I commit to you, you commit to me. So I very much believe in, in finding new mothers and fathers in my life. Now, I believe in prayer. Prayer is important to me. I'm not going to stand up here. People think I'm an evangelist anyway. Uh, I cannot tell you how many people have tuned in and said, I thought I was this evangelist on there. And... Uh, and I was about to flip it till I listened. But it's, you know, I, I share all my pain with you. Why, why shouldn't I share my spirituality with you? Uh, when I was in the monastery, I went 371 days without a sexual thought. So be careful what you pray for. <laughs> you, you understand this? Uh, uh, I used a prayer to the mother of Jesus. And boy, this baby's powerful. Little John's very impressed with this prayer. Uh, <laughs> Now, I, I, I really wouldn't want to ever do that again. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it was very powerful. And when my father was dying, he was in a coma, and I prayed with all my heart and that, that, that he, there would be enough time for his grandchildren. And, uh, and suddenly, I'm telling you, I put my hands on him, and he had a heartbeat. Now, now I'm not claiming anything miraculous. It scares me to even talk about it. But I believe in prayer, and my kid, my little kid, believes in prayer. And one of the sources of protection for people is prayer. Uh, now, sometimes I think prayer can be magical. People use it. If you let the inner child take over, he can make prayer magical, like people saying, uh, you know, God gave me tickets to Euler game today or a, a Raider, you know, a 49ers game. I, I'm not sure that's what the Almighty... <laughs> The source of the universe is doing is working out, you know, football tickets. But, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to mess with anybody else's belief system. And if that's your belief system, that's your belief system. The kid in you needs to know that there is a something greater than yourself. And anybody in their healthy shame, in my opinion, knows that there's something greater than themselves. The greatest philosopher maybe that ever lived was Immanuel Kant, and he talked about standing there in the wonder, looking at a starry night, and, and saying, how could anybody not believe that there was some design or something greater than himself? So I, I am very, you know, I'm very, that's very important for me in my championing work to let my inner child know that I believe in a source greater than us. And... Uh, uh, you know, I think that one of the most incredible things that I know about is the 12-step groups. Scott Peck said not long ago that when we come to look at the 20th century, we may not think of nuclear fission, we may think of Alcoholics Anonymous. That it's been so powerful, this healing phenomena. And of course, the 12-step programs are based on having had a spiritual awakening and an 11th step, uh, which talks about sought through prayer and meditation. 
This is what has cured alcoholics and addicts in a way that nothing else has. So for anybody not to notice that is not being very scientific, uh, that this has been the greatest single healing phenomenon we've known. Now, I think it's very important that we give our inner child some time and attention. This is a uh, my rendition of little John talking to big John the wizard. The idea is that one of the ways that you can give your inner child attention is to spend some time talking to them. Uh, I think many of you have been surprised. I've gotten letters, you know, from people in the workshops that they can't believe the energy of this child when they start doing this work or when they do the meditations. When you close your eyes and I say, you know, go to a house and see a little child there. People just can't believe the sadness that comes over them, the emotion that comes over them. So this is an energy that lives within us. This is one of the great contributions of Carl Jung to talk about the child. And then Eric Byrne came along and really helped us to understand that there is a fully formed child ego state inside of us that, 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 that we can go back and we can touch all the feelings of that child. So it's very important for me to connect with this part of me. This is the most vulnerable part of me. This is my feelings. This is my needs. So like in my dialogue, I'm going to show you another way to dialogue. I don't use visual dialogue, but a lot of people do. I use writing. Another way to do this is to write with your dominant hand. You saw people uh, in previous programs writing letters to the inner child with their dominant hand. Then we, you also saw an exercise where people write with their non-dominant hand. Uh, I, I used to have used that. Dear little John, how are you doing? What are you feeling? And then I answer with my non-dominant hand. So if any, some of you may, who are more kinesthetic, that means you're more touchy-feely. You're not visual. When you close your eyes, you don't see things. But, but you're very kinesthetic, you feel things. That might be a better way to dialogue with your child, is to allow yourself to write. And, and, and you write with the, with the dominant hand and answer with the non-dominant hand. The non-dominant hand writing feels like a child writing. There, there is some belief that it accesses the, the kind of way that a child thinks, more of a felt thought. I, I don't know of any data that, you know, that proves that. But I'll guarantee you, people who do this exercise, I have done it over the years, is a very powerful way to connect with the most vulnerable part of you, with your feelings. So I always start off by saying, what are you feeling? What are you feeling today? And uh, it's amazing how I've gotten in touch with my feelings doing this. Or I'll say, what are you needing? What are you wanting? See, because remember the programs where we went through the developmental stages and we talked about you, you got shamed for feeling your feelings. You got shamed for being needy. You got shamed for wanting. Uh, so it's real important. That's, that's how the child got lost. It's real important to connect with that vulnerable part of ourselves, to, to really connect with my feelings, my needs, my wants. Uh, some of you who've been following these programs remember we talked about one of the ways that the child contaminates our life is codependency. Codependency is a state where you don't know your internal cues. You don't know what you feel. You don't know what you need. You don't know what you want. So this kind of dialoguing can be very, very useful. Uh, it's very important if you're doing it visually to, to witness this. Imagine that you see on the right-hand side, the adult sitting in the chair or whatever, you, you know, do your own deal. Um, and that you see the child on the left-hand side and listen as they dialogue. This is an exercise more like your witnessing self is watching this dialogue and paying attention to it. So the visual way or the kinesthetic way are both useful ways to make contact with the child. What I want to tell you is that the child needs your time. Now, not a lot of time just to know you're there. What children need to know is you're there and you're not going to leave me. So what I recommend is pick a time and do this for five minutes, ten minutes. You're, you're worth it. You're worth that kind of time with yourself. And it, it's a real useful kind of way to connect with yourself. 
and to integrate your feelings, needs, and wants into your life. Remember, again, in previous programs where I talked about when you look in that face and you can't, you can't have your anger, you can't have your sadness, all those parts of you are split off. Here's a way to integrate them. Uh, another thing that I find uh, very, very useful uh, is to install new voices. To install new voices. And I want to I do this with you. I want to take you through a, a little exercise. You see, if you were growing up in a family and uh, somebody was saying, uh, quit being so selfish. Uh, so sh what are you feeling that far? Uh, what are you sad about? There's nothing to be sad about. Or quit bothering me. These are not real good voices to have imprinted in there. See, a little baby needs to be rocked and cuddled and hear that mama or daddy cooing. And, and what happens then is you internalize those soothing voices so that when you're alone, you have those voices in there. See, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but a lot of us have a lot of trouble when we're alone. <laughs> uh, it's like you've got a lot of bad voices in there. And uh, we've really got to monitor these voices because these are not your voices. These are internalized voices. And so it's very important that we learn how to instill new voices. So I, I'm going to take you through a little exercise. First thing I want you to do is just close your eyes for a minute. And I, I'll just take you through this. And those of you who are viewing at home, if you feel like going through this, do it. It's a very soothing, nurturing kind of exercise. Just allow yourself to see your inner child at whatever age they appear to you. Just imagine that a little child was walking up to you at whatever age they appear to you. And have them show you a still photo of something that happened to them. It's like, like they were coming to you as, as their champion. And they were going to show you a, a photograph. Look, here's what happened to me. Here's what happened to me. Here's when I got switched, or, or here's when I was humiliated in front of the whole class, or here's where they were, ye you know, Daddy used to yell at me. Now, just imagine that you could see that scene. You could see the child in that scene all by themselves. They're showing it to you, but they're suddenly in it. They're all by themselves and they're in the scene. They're all alone and walk into the scene like you're there. The grown up you is walking back in time into that scene. Here's this little girl. Here's this little boy. They just had a real bad time. And, and if they'll let you pick them up and hold them and tell them, now tell them what they needed to hear. You're just a little boy. Uh, it was real normal for you to be, it's real normal to be scared. It was real normal to be loud. It was real normal. Tell them, tell them some things they needed to hear, some soothing kind of words. And then just give them a nice big hug. Hold them real close to you. Let them know, tell them I'm your champion now. And we can go back and we can do a lot of these. And I can be there to tell you what you needed to hear. I can tell you what you needed to hear. And then just you and the child walk out of that scene together. Just you and the child walk out of the scene together and just be there with them and tell them I'm glad you're here 
and I'm glad to be your champion now. And I think you're beautiful just the way you are, and I love you. And then I can come back anytime you need me. I can be here anytime you need me. And I take a deep breath. Another deep breath, nice deep breath. And then just slowly open your eyes. So, we took a painful scene from the past. See, it's all there, it's all imprinted in there. You know, we've talked about these governing scenes, they're all in there. And you can go back. I, I, I said, I think it is too late to have a happy childhood, but I think you can go back and you can do a lot to heal some of those memories. And you can, you can let that child know that we can go back and you can hear these good voices. And then the other thing that I very much recommend you doing is taking those affirmations. We've gone through all four stages, the infancy, toddler, preschooler, uh, is, is whatever affirmations may have touched you, may have touched you, uh, like, like, I'm glad you're a girl, maybe that touched you, or I'm glad you're a boy. We, we saw a piece of videotape where two people were both witnessing that their mother was disappointed that he was a boy, Andy, and the gal's mother was disappointed that she was a girl, or the father was disappointed that she was a girl. So it's very important to give the child the special kind of words, the very special kind of words that the child needs to hear. So, so that's very, very important. Now, this can be very powerful, and you can do this with your inner child. You can do a lot of this. Uh, again, the caution that I give you is this is not something to do with incest scenes, uh, are, are those very traumatic scenes. You need more protection uh, you, unless you've been working on it a long time. Uh, you, you feel like you're on the other side of your therapy and you're ther if you're with a therapist and your therapist says that would be all right for you to do that. But if you've been working on that, be sure you have permission before you do that. A lot of us can use these techniques, but depending on the kind of abuse and the severity of the abuse, Sometimes the affect can be so intense that if you get in it, it's hard to get out of it. So, so the most important thing is keeping yourself safe, keeping your little child safe. If any, anything that I suggest scares you, just don't do it. When we do the workshops, I say to people, look, if something's frightening to you, you don't need to give any reasons for not doing it. It's very important for you to take care of yourself. We want to look at some new learnings. Now, I've, I've taken uh, these, I'm only giving you a few of them, from a lot, a lot of different sources. There are a lot of people who are doing reparenting work. I've mentioned Pamela Levin's Cycles of Power. I mentioned, uh, I haven't mentioned John and Laurie Weiss, uh, who do this kind of work. You might want to find something that they're doing. Barry and Janae Weinhold. There's a lot of people doing reparenting kind of work. Uh, and uh, they're too, too numerous for me to name. But enjoy a hot tub. Focus on bodily sensations. Now, now some of you already do this kind of stuff, uh, and, and you may not know why you're so attracted to it. And what it may be is that you didn't get your infancy needs met. And if you did the exercise in one of the previous programs and you found out, man, I'm a lost child, I didn't get these needs met, then this may be something really important for you to work on. Uh, like, I have had a lot of trouble allowing people to touch me unless, you know, it's a pretty long way into a relationship. I like to be the toucher. I don't like to be touched uh, because I, uh, there's sort of that, that distrust of being out of control. Now, I'm working on this, you know, I'm working on this. This, this, this series has been a good, good training for me to let people take care of me. Uh, but uh, bodily sensations, remember infancy is about tactile, kinesthetic, it comes through touch and 
sound and hearing the cooing and the echoing voices and being held. Uh, uh, the study that was done, the United Nations people, when they went to, uh, to Uganda to study the uh, uh, protein deficiency in the children, and they found for the first two years they were the most advanced children in the world. But they, they were held, they were put in their mother's saffron gowns and they were held up against their mother's body all the time. They were always in gentle motion being touched. And you see how much we need that kind of touching. Some people are starving. They have skin hunger. Have skin hunger. So treat yourself to regular massages. Have a friend feed you. Have a good friend that will take you out to eat periodically. When, when, when your infancy issues are coming up, remember these are recycled when you're in life transitions, when you're in a crisis, whenever you're starting anything new. Have a friend feed you. Periods of doing nothing. I just love to, to do nothing. Where are you going? Nowhere. What are you doing? Nothing. What's your five-year plan? Don't have a two-minute plan. And just wandering around in a shopping mall, see? Uh, listen to soft lullaby music. Uh, uh, rest before doing anything new. In the workshops, we use a lot of lullabies and sweet dreams, some of Stephen Halpern's music, and, and oh man, I love to just listen to that music. Uh, gaze at a partner for nine minutes. Uh, one of the exercises we do is just gazing and have people see if they can see the child in each other. And incredible, everybody can. If you just sit there and, and, and uh, you know, you can make faces and you can, the only thing you can't do is talk. Uh, and, and it'll really connect you with that infant uh, and uh, that gazing, that need to gaze. Now, so, and, and there's a whole bunch more. There's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, toddler needs. Let's say you really got it that you didn't get your toddler needs. Go to a flea market and examine everything. Go to a store and pick everything up. Uh, just wander around touching everything you want to touch. See, this is what toddlers are doing. They're, you know, they're elate explorers of each sense without dismay, without pretense. They're just touching and tasting and experiencing life. Children have this, this immediate sense of uh, sensory acuity. When I started doing neuro-linguistic training, uh, I couldn't believe what some of these trainers were seeing. They were picking up uh, accessing cues in people's faces. And I'd be sitting there with the guy next to me thinking, boy, we're in the biggest hoax going. I see nothing. Uh, they'd say, did you see that? Did you see that nostril flare? Uh, did, did, did you see that facial tissue change? Uh, did you see that breathing change? Did you see the lip size change? And all of a sudden I began to understand there's all this data that you can pick up if, you just, if you're willing to look and listen. Pick up nuances and pick up the feelings in people's speech. And we really know a lot about each other. Uh, sensory acuity. You know, we know there are perfumers who can pick out all kinds of scents, and they're wine tasters, what I always wanted to be. Uh, they're <laughs> wine tasters who, who, who can tell you this is from a vineyard in 1812. Uh, you know, uncanny. They can tell you what vineyard it came from. And uh, it was said of scouts, Indian scouts, that they could see for miles around, and people play music by ear, sensory acuity. I've actually done some of Dolores Krieger's work, laying on hands. It's not a religious laying on hands, it's therapeutic touch, using the chakra energies in the hands. And uh, this is powerful stuff. We did a workshop in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. A woman found a tumor in her husband. They had no idea it was there. Just had never done this before in her life, going down his body, accessing the energy, accessing the energy. See, see, it's like when we're abused as children, we numb out. We die, and the only way we can have a life is through our addictions, through, through our doings. We become human doings. We don't know about being. We don't know how it is just to be uh, and, and to, to really be in touch with yourself, with, you know, Zen seeing. The Zen masters talk about seeing, really seeing things and hearing things. So hang out with kids at a playground. 
I mean, didn't you love to do that with your own kids or grandkids? I mean, I love to go to the park, and it wasn't about my son. Uh, you know, I loved Christmas because I'd get new electric trains every year while he played with boxes. Uh, <laughs> such a deal. Spend some time playing with clay or, you know, this tactile stuff. Or did you come out of where, where that's dirty? Oh, God, you can't touch anything because you've got this anal compulsive uh, upbringing. Uh, go to the park with a friend. Practice Zen seeing. Just, just look at things. Really look at a leaf or the bark of a tree. Or there's an exercise that uh, uh, the Gestalt people do where you pretend like I'm, I, I take you with me, I blindfold you, or I have you close your eyes and I hold your hand, and when I squeeze, it's like a camera lens, and you open your eyes. When I squeeze, you open your eyes, and I take you up to things so that you can just focus on what you're looking at. See, it's like being. You just focus on the being of the thing. Uh, and that's sensory acuity, learning sensory acuity. Practice saying no. John and Laurie Weiss have this technique where you just walk around for a week by yourself saying, nope, no, oh, no, uh-uh, nah, ni no, no, ho, ho, no way, Jose, oh, no. Uh, all right. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. That, that's the first week. That's only the first week. The second week, you get a friend, and you make a contract with them that no matter what you say to me, I'm going to say no. Now, if you've ever hung around with a two-year-old, so you get your friend, and they know, and you ask them things, and you practice saying no. And then the third week, you got to really do it. You got to really say no to somebody. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't do that particular technique, although I like that, but I had to learn how to say no. See, addicts do not know how to say no. Uh, good guy, people-pleasing, sweethearts do not know how to say no. A lot of us who are addicted to caretaking do not know how to say no. And it's gotten us in a lot of trouble in our life. A lot of painful stuff in our life because we couldn't say no. You know, uh, sexual stuff. You couldn't say no. You didn't have boundaries. Uh, stuff in your life you didn't want to do because you didn't have boundaries. See, no is a boundary. No is a boundary. Healthy shame is a boundary. One of the biggest problems that abused children have is their boundaries are violated. If you can be hit just at the discretion of the big giant, anytime they want to, because they own you, then you don't have a physical boundary. And then if, you can, if somebody sexualizes you, somebody incests you, they're violating your sexual boundaries. Or they, there's no boundaries in your house. You, you know, people bounce in the bathroom when you're there. Nobody ever, there's no space you can go to. Uh, practice expressing anger. Now, anger is tough. And what I do is I, I, I stay with what I see. Here's what I see. Here's what I hear. Here's what I interpret. Here's what I feel. And here's what I want. I saw you dancing with Billy 12 times. I interpreted you were enjoying that and you were kind of turned on. I felt scared and angry. And I want to know what that's about. It's a healthy way to express anger. Told you what I saw. Told you what I interpreted. Told you what I felt. Told you what I wanted. I'm staying inside my own skin. Now, here's another way to do it. God, you were disgusting last night. That made me sick watching an old woman like you dancing with that young boy. Now, boy, see, I'm going for the juggler. But, but do you see how, how totally shaming and totally ineffective that is to be saying that to somebody? What, what could any human being do except go, go into a defensive posture when somebody's beaten up on them like that? So if I'll stay under my skin, now you've got to practice this. You're not going to do this in your next big con. Let's see, what did Branch all say? Uh, uh, if you don't practice this ahead of time. But, but the point is that where did you learn how to express anger? Where did your inner child learn how at home? What did you see modeled for you? See? Uh, so, pra and, and working on want lists. What do you want? What do you want? Right now, I know what I want in my life. I'm 57, and I know what I want to be when I grow up. Uh, so, uh, it's incredible. But half my life, I haven't known what I wanted. 
Now, preschool, practice asking lots of questions because that's what preschoolers do. Let me, let me check this out. Let me be sure if I'm getting this right. Here's what I heard you saying. Is that right? Or, or let, let me check something out. You look like you're upset right now. Is that right? No, I'm not upset. Well, wait a minute. I hear it in your voice that it sounds like you're upset. See, I check it out. And that's what a lot of us were never allowed to do as kids. We were never allowed to ask questions. Practice being aware of feelings. If, if you're aware of a feeling, exaggerate it. You know, like, <laughs> uh, well, go look in the mirror. If you're starting to feel a little bit sad, go look in the mirror and just make a face and get it as sad as you, you can. I worked with Alexander Lowen one time. He's a body therapist, and he, and he puffs these muscles in my face, and all of a sudden I was just sobbing. I was just sobbing, and I could see this scene, this old scene with my dad where, where he had abandoned me. And I, my God, I had no idea that was right there. Uh, you know, it was right there in my body. And, 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 but what one of his techniques was to make you get your face in the posture of what the feeling would be like. By the way, feeling is manifested in the face more than any other place. So like, go to the mirror if, you're, if you feel some anger. If you have trouble with anger, you're a good guy, people-pleasing sweetheart, and people walk all over you. Get in the mirror and go, Rawr! and growl. Make growling noises and do wood chopper. Ah! You know, you may scare yourself, but it, but it's okay. I mean, it's it's like that's the idea. Ma uh, communication skills. I mean, how are you going to learn? Did you see mom and dad say, say, Joe, I have some anger I want to deal with here. I'm going to stay in iMessages and sensory-based detail. Is that what you saw at your dinner table? So so now again, I'm not trying to put your parents down or my parents down. They just didn't know how to do this. This is a hundred years of therapy that has helped us to understand this. Virginia Satir used to see the, the, the level of dysfunction in families just by listening to the communication and the level of codependency in families. It was absolute work of art to watch her communicate with people. Um, confront, uh, so confronting magical expectations. Hey, don't wait. Don't try hard. Do it. If you, don't wait. If you're waiting for your prince to come, no, no, go call. Go, go get phone numbers and, and call and put a sign on you. I'm looking for a prince. Uh, I'm looking for a princess. You know, don't, don't. Uh, I mean, this wait, waiting, sometimes you have to wait. But don't do it if you don't have to. It's a magical act. See, it's all that fairy tale stuff. That if you just wait long enough, long enough, your prince will come. Your princess will come. Uh, I had about an 80-year-old woman come in for therapy one day, just furious. She had been waiting 42 years. You know, she was really angry. Uh, uh, and nobody had come. Um, I remember when I came out of the seminary, I, I thought, well, now, you know, it'll get around fairly quick that they know John Bradshaw is out of the seminary. And... Uh, I'll, I'll just sort of wait for the companies to call. And uh, about four months later, uh, I had this guy that was a sponsor in a 12-step group, and he drove me to the, 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 the superhighway, the, the, you know, the big thoroughfare, and, and it was about 7 in the morning. And I said, what are we doing here? And he just sat there silent. I said, what are we doing here? And he said, well, you see all those cars? I said, sure I see these cars. What, what is this all? He said, they're going to work, John. <laughs> They're going to work. <laughs> I said, oh, I see. You have to go out and ask somebody for a job. Uh, see, this magical little, I had been a side study to be a priest, why people should be beating their door down uh, to come find me. Uh-uh, that isn't the way it works. Confront the magic. Confront toxic guilt. You have a right to your own life. You have a right to your own life. Uh, create a bond with same-sex groups. Now, I don't want that to sound sexist. A lot of us have not had fathers. A lot of us men have never bonded with men. There's a lot of homophobia, a lot of beating up on gay people out of that homophobia because men have never been loved by men and don't feel lovable as men. Now, a lot of women have never been loved by women and don't feel lovable as women. So what happens? to the inner child when that happens, you think you've got to have a man to be fixed. But you, if you don't have a man, well, 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 you might as well give your body to science. Uh, 
If I don't have a woman, and I did that, I, I, I went to women to be fixed. I went to Holy Mother Church to be fixed in my life. And what I found was, and this has been, I've had this for about seven years, my fathers, my new family, are, are a group of men. And, oh, man, to experience fear, to express fear with other men, to cry in front of other men, to have other men tell me they love me, to call me to myself when I'm beaten up on myself, to be vulnerable is, is really powerful. And I have Johnny, and I have George, and I have Michael, and, oh, man, is it wonderful. And that's been a very important thing for me. Now, I'm not saying that that may be what you need to do, but I'm suggesting that a lot of wounded in their kids have a lot of, of sexual confusion, have never, don't really love ourselves for who we are, uh, set goals and experiment with goals. Uh, this is one of the things, purpose is one of the tasks of preschool children. Now, now again, there's tons more things you can do there, but all the major therapies help people with these kind of things. Uh, new learnings for school age. Life skills. There's just a lot of stuff I didn't learn to do. See, one of the jobs of parents is to give time, to give attention, and to give direction. To give direction. Uh, I, I can barely change a light bulb. When my car breaks down, if there's a woman around, I open the car and take the dipstick out. <laughs> pretending like I know what I'm doing. And why, why? Because, I mean, I feel like, you know, I have these tapes in my head that real men are supposed to know how to fix mechanical things. And, you know, so if a woman's around, if there's a woman around, I just leave the thing, go call AAA. Because I, I haven't the foggiest idea what's in there. Uh, and uh, not the foggiest idea. And, uh, but, but, you know, the point is that, that I never learned how to do any of that. Now, you know, maybe in retirement I'm going to learn how to fix some stuff like that. Maybe not, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Social skills. How many of you have trouble when you get in a social, you know, you go to a party? Uh, when I quit drinking, I, I couldn't imagine why anybody went to a party. Uh, uh, the, the only way I knew how to have any fun in a party was to be crocked. Uh, or, or, you know, to stand there by the hors d'oeuvre table and eat uh, over in the corner. But, but, you know, you have to learn social skills. Social skills are something that we can be taught. Uh, if, if we, they can be modeled for us. So, so it's very important. Set, setting intellectual boundaries, practicing values clarification. I talked about that in another program. What, what is it that you stand for? What do you believe? What are, what are your beliefs as opposed to parent tapes? Just something you've internalized. Remember I talked about, is it something you've chosen? Did you choose it from alternatives? Do you understand the consequences of it? Do you prize and cherish it? That is, you really have commitment to it? Uh, do you act on it? Do you act on it repeatedly? Uh, is it something you would publicly proclaim if you needed to? Your belief system, if, if it were appropriate? See, that's a value. Now, if, you're, if you don't have those qualities in it, it's some, you do it once a year. You go to the synagogue once a year. That, that's not a value. Uh, that's probably uh, the terrors of hell or something, uh, or, or Gehenna or whatever. Uh, but, but it's probably not a value. A value is something that is chosen from alternatives. You know the consequences. You prize and cherish it. You act on it. You act on it repeatedly. And if necessary, you'll proclaim it. See, are you a value to yourself? Do you value yourself? W would you stand up and say, I am a good and wonderful person? Uh, that, you know, I am valuable. Uh, this, is, this is what we've been talking about in, in these other programs, uh, being devalued. Abuse devalues children. Abuse devalues you, and it's hard to develop that as adults. And this is the best way I know to develop it, to start connecting with that child and championing the child. And, and really, what values are intellectual boundaries. They are what you stand for. Look, here are my sexual boundaries. Here, here's what I know I will do that I feel comfortable with, and here's what I won't do. And I'm real clear about that. Now, I'm not saying you have to flip this out on every date. You know, <laughs> hey, Buster, you know, and here, here. Uh, but I think it's very important to have, have such values, uh, to have body values. You know, I see people... Uh, come up and hug someone without even asking them. 
uh, or just sort of get in their space. And, and the more abused people are, often the worse their boundaries are. It's like you don't have good boundaries because nobody respected or valued your boundaries. See, how do you learn boundaries? By, by noticing, by having people who respect your boundaries. So brainstorming a problem with friends, co-creating a solution. Remember, this is a cooperative stage. The school age is a cooperative stage. Practice negotiating conflict. Uh, there are ways we can learn to fight fair. There are ways we can learn to fight fair. Breaking parental enmeshments. Now, now that's a whole technique that I use, but, but that's, a lot about, uh, that's a lot about the idea that many of us were bonded to a parent, either a parent of the same sex, a parent of the opposite sex. And a lot of this inner child work, uh, I put that here because it's sort of like when you're leaving home, it's really important to leave home. It's really important to break that bonding with that parent. And a lot of people have not done that. They don't know how to do that. Uh, I have some exercises that I do. Uh, there's some wonderful exercises that Connie and Steve Andreas, who are NLP people, have developed in their works for breaking those kind of enmeshments. Those of you who did the, uh, who did the, the work on homecoming, you did the exercise and you said goodbye, that's breaking an enmeshment. Uh, so that, that is too, you know, it's just something that I want you to know that you can do. And the grief work is a way that you can do it. So championing, championing this child is a way that all of us uh, can learn to integrate this energy into our lives. Uh, uh, I have people in the workshops finish the fairy tales that they start. And, uh, you know, I wrote my fairy tale, and then I write an ending to the fairy tale. So it's, it's a wonderful kind of experience to begin to be this child's champion. And in my opinion, a lot of the coldness, the, the rage, the anger, the violence in the world comes from this wounded child. That, that when I see people who are angry and who are, who are isolating and you can't get close to them, there's a little kid in there that wants to be loved, wants to be close. A girl named Mary sent me this poem. It's an anonymous poem. It talks about six humans trapped by happenstance in black and bitter cold. The poem's called The Coal Within. Each one possessed a stick of wood, or so the story's told. Their dying fire and needed logs, the first man held his back, for on the faces around the fire he noticed that one was black. The next man, looking across the way, saw one not of his church, and he wouldn't bring himself to give the fire that stick of birch. The third man sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should he put his log to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the pot fire passed from sight, for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this forlorn group did nothing except for gain. Giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. So, their logs held tight in death's still grasp was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. Uh, this is a beautiful poem. I wished I knew who wrote this. If anybody is out there and you wrote this, please let me know. But, but the healing of that child, championing that child, the child is very healing. Children have fights and then they kiss and hug. Walt Disney, when he died, Disney understood this. Listen to what Severide said when Disney died. He was an original, not just an American original, but an original, period. One of the happiest this century has ever experienced. He probably did more to heal or at least soothe the troubled human spirit than all the psychiatrists in the world. What Walt Disney seemed to know was that while there's very little adult in a child, there's tons of child in every adult. And to a child, the, wor the world is brand new every day and grumpy and sneezy and Snow White may be fantasy, but they're a lot better than ICBMs. Boy, I mean, what a statement. So look, next time we're going to find your wonder child. So join me again then.
Bye-bye.